Today on Call for Two, my top five party and cooperative games from Gen Con 2023. Is there a game here for your group? Stay tuned to find out. All of the games I'm going to talk about today were purchased by myself. I have no relationship or sponsorship from any companies. These will be my top five party and cooperative games in no particular order and two bonus entries. These aren't games, I haven't made a comprehensive search of every game released during Gen Con. These are just my picks. All of these games will be available soon, if not already, for about $20 to $40 each. The first game on my list is Agree to Disagree. This is a competitive party game for two to eight players. Really four to eight, I think, is your target size. At two, the game sort of becomes boring. The way the game works is that there's a moderator on each round that revolves. You flip over a card. There's a big stack of cards here. It's mostly useless deck, however. But you flip out over a card. Maybe the person to the moderator's left picks out one of these categories. And then the moderator tries to come up with a divisive question. A statement that people can agree or disagree with. For example, in this case, I might say blondes have more fun. But you could say anything. As long as you think people are going in your group who are playing are going to come up, or some are going to agree, some are going to disagree. And everyone, you can see there are eight of these things, they're, the colors don't matter, but everyone at the table will get one of these devices. This is a good game for playing while everyone is standing up. They look the same. Again, color doesn't matter. But on the bottom, you can see that one of the sides is marked with a heart and one with a heart with an X. So the heart side would be if you agree with the statement and then you'd hold it facing the X if you disagree. So everyone picks whether they agree or disagree. And this is where the fun starts. The player clockwise of the moderator goes first. And they try to pick someone in the group they think they're going to disagree with. Do blondes have more fun? So they pick one person in the group and then they combine their devices. If they disagree, this is what will happen. It'll be flush. If you were to pick someone you agree with, you would combine them and it wouldn't go all the way in. If you found some, if you, the person you picked you disagree with, you get a point and the moderator gets a point, sort of a reward for picking a good divisive question. And then the person you chose would go next and they would have to pick someone else left in the group, not including you, you already went, that they think, remember all these are down, that they think they will disagree with, they match if they, if they disagree, as in here, again, they get a point and the moderator gets a point. When it comes down to just two people left, they each get a token and secretly vote whether they think they're going to agree or disagree and get their points that way. So, why is this such a cool game? Um, first of all, it has the things I look for in a party game. The rules are super simple, super easy to play. It's suitable for mixed groups that you might have some people who are serious gamers, strategy, and some people just want to have fun. There is some interesting strategy. It's got that very clever idea we see in a bunch of games where the person who comes up with the question is incentivized 
to come up with a question that's going to create a good game. Because if they come up with a statement that everyone agrees on, they're not going to get any points. If everyone disagrees, they're not going to get any points. They have to split the room. That's a brilliant idea, and it works here. The other thing that's so good about this is this is like a real icebreaker game. You could imagine getting together in groups and getting to know each other. You, your group can pick however risque you want the questions to be. However, you could pick political questions. You could pick very simple questions that aren't going to create controversy, but you could also tiptoe your waters into topics that are going to get people to really disagree. And... There's the visceral fun of matching up with someone and then being like, what? <laughs> you agree with me? And for me, I love the party games where there's very lighthearted arguing and accusing and debating. And this is one of these games that really creates that for me. Now... Um, there's also a little bit of strategy involved in saying, well, okay, those two disagreed. Who am I most likely to align with? You've got your strategy of picking who you are going to risk trying to disagree with. It's very fun. You learn about each other and there's a little bit of strategy here. Now, my groups, two different groups I played this with, had very different reactions. Some of them hated it and some of them thought it was a super cool idea. For me, this is kind of what I want in a party game. Easy to pick up, easy to play, lots of fun, laughter. Um, so there you have it, agree to disagree. The next game on my list is Ensemble. This is a two to 10 player cooperative party game. I'd say at two, it doesn't play very well, but it is playable technically at two. In the game, which proceeds in a number of rounds, you start at round two, you win as a group if you can get yourself up and past round nine. Based on the round, you lay out that many cards. So on the second round, you'd lay out two cards and then you lay out one challenge card. Everyone in the group gets their own deck of voting cards. They're color coded, but it doesn't really matter. So there's 10 of these little decks with numbers from one to nine. Everyone secretly picks which of the two cards here at top best match this card. So it's a little bit like a cooperative Dixit. So you might reason, well, before you say anything, everyone picks their card and they play it face down. Is one closer to this or is two closer to this? Everyone votes. Let's say it was this way. Then we reveal, oh, I guess before that happens, you have to lay out some of these tokens. Okay, so you lay out tokens here. These are sort of your life counters based on the number of players. So if we're only playing two players, it would be just those two. As you get larger groups, you get tokens that allow one or more people to disagree with the group. You're trying to get on the same wavelength. So if we were playing a two player game, in this case, both players said this card was a better match for this than this. That's correct. Then we would take the card that the majority voted for, put it down here, get rid of this. You could at this point debate about like, why did you pick this? Well, we say triangles, triangles, maybe the color scheme, etc. It was dry without waves. Okay, so these go away. And now you're up to round three. You put three cards out. And now the group has to figure out which of these three cards best matches this card, and so on. When you get something wrong, you flip one of your lives over. If you lose all of your lives before you get to nine, you lose. If everyone agrees, you can get to flip one of these over. And that's about it. Now, why do I like this game so much? And I should say my groups again split on this. Uh, half of them really liked it and liked it over Dixit and half of them 
thought it was boring and no skill involved, etc. So this isn't really a skill-based game, but it does have the things that I look for in a party game. First of all, plays t up to 10 players very quickly. It's all simultaneous action. I enjoy the process of seeing how different people think differently. It's the fun moment when everyone reveals their card and you're like, what? What were you thinking? How could you not see that this is the obvious connection? And that's a very fun moment. I love that sort of lighthearted, low risk arguing and debating. It's not a skill-based game. No one is put on the spot. Sometimes you play Dixit and people get un sort of uncomfortable being in the spotlight, having to come up with a term. This isn't like that at all. Everything's out. All you're doing is voting and getting on, trying to get on the same wavelength. And it does sometimes happen that the group sort of narrows down to the same wavelength. I love it. I love the arguing. I love the debate. I love the challenge of trying to get on the same wavelength as everyone else. Fun, not for everyone. If you like Dixit, this might be for you. Next up, a bit of a change of pace is Forbidden Jungle. This is a two to five player cooperative strategy game, a serious strategy game. It's the fourth game in the Forbidden series by Matt Leacock, the designer of Pandemic. Plays in about 60 minutes, maybe the longest of the series of short cooperative games in this series. Uh, in this game, players are trapped on a jungle trying to reconfigure this forest to bring a certain configuration and escape the jungle. There are three different kinds of creatures, from eggs to hatchlings to these giant spider adults that are moving around trying to harm you. Each player has a special ability, special role that gives them a special ability. You can move, flip tiles, explore, activate machines to try to reconfigure the board or destroy the creatures, special equipment you can get. It is a real strategy game that will require some serious coordination, cooperation for um, for 60 minutes, it's there's a lot packed in here, highly thematic, and my favorite of the series. Perhaps a little more random than I would like. If you're curious to learn more about Forbidden Jungle, you can see the full playthrough we put up, which is about 90 minutes, our quick 10-minute review of the game, and then our long, hour-long, in-depth discussion on the channel. Now for something really different. This is Night Hunter, a cooperative, really solo, cold case, document dump mystery game. If you're not familiar with this genre, it's basically a game where you're given lots of documents, newspapers, police reports, witness statements, various physical things to work with, and you're trying to solve a mystery. This one is on the long deluxe side of these games. In fact, probably you've got three standalone three standalone cold case games worth of content in this one box, this one continuing story. It really benefits from being able to take its time to develop this story. I've played it now on YouTube with an experienced group. It took us about 11 hours. Won't take you 11 hours to play, but maybe a good three or four. There's no destruction here. You can only play it once, but you could pass it along. Maybe a bit on the easier side. I'm not going to show you any of the components really, but you can just take a look at some of the flavor of the different kinds of documents you get and files. And it's, it's set up so that each chapter unfolds and gives you new exciting developments. Highly recommended, very thematic. One of the more atmospheric, compelling cases I've played if on the easier side, might be a great way to jump into this genre if you've never tried it. Next up is Sky Team. This is a cooperative two-player only dice placement game. It was very popular at Gen Con and I can see why. In this game, both players have a set of dice. They've got seven rounds. They're trying to land a plane. 
the game comes with a bunch of different configurations for different airports at different difficulty levels. It even comes with a whole bunch of little modular expansions that it's got broken up into different scenarios at different difficulties so you can tune it. Um, on each round, the players will roll their dice. You've got a pilot and a co-pilot, mostly the same task, but slightly specialized. You don't see each other's dice, and you're not allowed to talk during placement rounds. You take turns placing dice. And remember, you're not allowed to talk and coordinate, and once all four dice are placed from all the players, all the two players, uh, then things happen, and then you can talk again before the next round. There's various actions you can take to mitigate the luck of the roll. There is a substantial amount of luck, but there is a lot of strategy here, a lot of deep strategy, and fascinating strategy in terms of what information you're, coord you're communicating to the other player non-verbally by the actions you take, and lots of interesting timing decisions. It's a surprisingly deep game, a game that's really going to be for strategy gamers, not for casual gamers. It's very easy to teach. It plays super fast, about 30 minutes or less per scenario. You can play several in a session, but you're going to need to have players of fairly equal skill here. Uh, you don't get an alpha player problem because one person can't tell another person what to do, really. But for that same reason, you need to have a sort of balanced set of two players who know what they're doing and want to enjoy some serious, thinky communication strategies, implicit communication strategies. You can check out our channel soon for a full playthrough and review. So there you have it, five of my favorite cooperative and party games from Gen Con 2023. I'd love to hear from you if you've got games you liked better. If you've played any of these, what you thought, let me know in the comments and I'll see you on the next video.